So I'm going to ask you to think for a moment about a time when you felt like an outsider. Uh, maybe it was family. Sometimes the family dynamics are not quite so healthy, and maybe there were others that seemed felt like the, the insiders, and they knew what was going on, and you didn't belong. Or maybe that was in school. You can observe it from the time kids are, are very little, uh, where some kids are kind of grouped together, and then other kids are made to feel outsiders. And you see that often in, on the playground and in the cafeteria. When I was a kid, they used to select teams, and I think they're better. They don't do this anymore, but back then they had like two team captains, and they would choose the kids who would be on their team, and it was always death to be the last kid picked to be on the team. Or maybe that, that place where you felt excluded was in a workplace. Maybe you were the, the new person and everybody else seemed to know what was going on and, and you felt lost and, and very much an outsider. Or sad to say, sometimes that can even be in a church where everybody else seems like they know what's going on and there's an in crowd and you feel like you're the outsider. Most of us at one point or another have felt that experience of being unwelcome, disconnected, not part of the group. I want you to hold on for that a little bit as I read in the Gospel of Luke in the 14th chapter. We see Jesus in an encounter uh, with some people in his day, and that feeling that I ask you to draw up is very much built into this encounter. So Luke, one of the accounts of, of Jesus' life, starts in the 14th chapter by telling us on one occasion, Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees, the main religious leaders of his day, to eat a meal on the Sabbath. And they were watching him closely. Luke sets this up, and then there's a little bit of a story before he actually gets to the dinner party that kind of sets up part of the attitude of those that he's going to spend time with. Just then, in front of him, in front of Jesus, there was a man who had dropsy. I didn't know what dropsy was. I had to Google it. Uh, dropsy is an old-fashioned word for anemia. I didn't know what anemia was either, so I had to Google that. Uh, but anemia is a buildup of, of uh, liquid in your tissues, you know, when your feet are swollen or in its extreme examples, I assume that it was by the fact they could see this in the man, your lungs can fill up with fluid and, and even your heart. So it can be dangerous. Jesus asked the lawyers and the Pharisees, is it lawful to cure people on the Sabbath or not? The Sabbath being a day of rest, you shouldn't do any work on that day, but they were silent. There were too many of these encounters where Jesus interacted with them and uh, they kind of, um, they, they usually lost those encounters, so they don't, even, they don't even respond to Jesus' comment. So Jesus took the man and he healed him and sent him away. And then he said to them, if one of you has a child or an ox that has fallen into a well, will you not immediately pull it out on the Sabbath day? Of course you're going to, to, to save their life. And Jesus had the opportunity to heal this man, so he did. And they could not reply to this. You get a little sense of their hardness of heart. And then into the main story. When he, Jesus, noticed how the guests chose the places of honor at this dinner party he's been invited to, he told them a parable, a little teaching story. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host, and the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place, and then in disgrace, you would start to take the lower place. Maybe that's why they have place cards at weddings now, because this used to happen. And you could see someone, you know, kind of like, oh, I'm going to get a good seat. And then they kind of move you on down in your disgrace. Instead, Jesus says what you should do is when you're invited, go and sit down at the lowest place. Be willing to take the humble place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. And then you'll be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. 
And then Jesus says something that he says at different places in his ministry, this, this idea. He says, for all who exalt themselves, all who want the best place, all who kind of want to get ahead and be in the place of honor, they will be humbled. But those who humble themselves, who are willing to serve and take that lower place, they themselves will be exalted. He goes on then and he says, he said also to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. This probably sounds familiar. We saw this, we heard this and saw it acted out in the mini movie. But Jesus ends this by saying, but when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Whoa, wait a minute, where did, where did, he, where did he come up with that? He suddenly takes this about being kind and welcoming to, to folks at a dinner party, and he says you'll be re repaid at the resurrection of the righteous, that this actually matters in God's eternal plan. I want to point out three simple things in this story that Jesus tells that are worth holding on to. There are three kind of banquet observations, if you will, briefly. The first of those is be the one that does the inviting. So earlier, I asked you to, to think on and imagine a time when you felt outside and unwelcome and not part. But maybe, maybe you've had the experience as well of feeling like this and somebody went out of their way to make you feel welcome. Maybe it was in school and they said, hey, come, come sit with us. Or maybe your best friend was the team captain, and even though you stunk at the game, they chose you first to be on their team. Or maybe it was the workplace where somebody went out of their way and said, hey, let me teach you the ropes here and help you get to know some people and how we do things here. Or maybe it was a new church and somebody said, hey, come, come sit with me. Didn't that feel good? Didn't that feel wonderful when somebody went out of their way to welcome and invite and make you feel special? Be the one that does that. Pay attention and look around for the folks that don't belong and invite them and make them feel special. If it feels good to us to be the one included, then be the one that includes someone else. Be the one who invites. And then also, it's very much implied by the story but there's something about God's plan that comes up in this. Uh, this story that Jesus tells kind of reminds us that we are invited by God. In fact, in a similar story um, elsewhere, uh, the, the Jesus makes it quite clear that the one who does the grand inviting, in that particular story, it's the king who invites people in and reminds us that God invites us. So maybe you've always felt like an outsider and maybe no one has ever gone out of their way to welcome and invite you and make you feel included. But if you're in that place, know that God always invites you. You are always part of God's kingdom, always part of God's special included ones. That no matter what happens with others, God always wants you part of God's family. You are always invited and welcomed by God. And then last, that ending that Jesus added, uh, this reminder that this isn't just about here, but this is eternally. Eternally, we get to enjoy this opportunity to invite and make feel welcome. I don't know exactly how heaven works in this respect. And I find it hard to imagine God reordering people at the grand ba banquet eternal of those who have done better than those who haven't. 
and I'm not quite sure exactly what Jesus means, means that you will be repaid. I, I've never really pictured when you do something kind and welcoming and generous for somebody else that God's like putting a treasure in store in heaven. The way I've always imagined that is that you're repaid by knowing that you've done that. I mean, when we're eternally with God, when we live with God forever, I think we have a memory of everything that we did here. We get to hold on to that. And unlike, especially as I get older, my memory is fading. In heaven, the memory is perfect. And you understand the full implication and the full joy of the opportunities to bless and love and welcome and invite. And I suppose... On the converse, the places where we've been mean or cruel or hurtful or just missed the opportunity to include someone else, we're aware of that as well. We're forgiven that, but we remember it. And so I think when Jesus says that we're repaid, we're just remembering. We get to hold on to it all and live eternally with it. So when we invite when we make feel welcome, when we love, when we care for. We're storing up treasures in heaven, Jesus says, elsewhere. Treasured memories. So maybe in the imagery that Jesus uses, who are you inviting to your banquets? Who are you loving and blessing and making to feel welcome? Who are you inviting to your banquet?